Coming off the heels of the 2002 TCG list, the OCG saw some of the most powerful cards in the game printed. Cards which could potentially never come off the ban list without errata. One of those cards is Fiber Jar, which is likely the most powerful jar card because it virtually resets the duel, outside of life points, and the cards removed from play. Fiber Jar goes beyond the hand refill and board destruction of Morphing and Cyber Jar by also offering card recursion. The greatest testament to the power of the card is how it is technically possible to FTK with Final Countdown and recurring Pyro Clock of Destiny. Although not as powerful as Fiber Jar, Yadagarasu was the bane of many players as it could remove the plus one of drawing a card every turn. Although its partner in crime, Chaos Emperor Dragon, would not be printed until the following year. So the limitation instead of ban seems more reasonable. Mage power was limited for the same reason as United We Stand, offering the equipped monster a maximum attack increase of 3000 with the full back row and the field spell. Although the ceiling of United We Stand is higher, the ease of setting spells and traps compared to summoning monsters makes Mage Power a viable option for control decks. Ring of Destruction was moved down to limited status, as targeted removal and symmetric burn can swing the game, or in some cases even end it. One problem with the design space of the card, which was eventually fixed with an erratum, was that the card caused ties, which is a terrible problem in the tournament setting. Bizarrely, last turn to semi-limited having previously been at unlimited status. It dances around both the TCG and OCG list, eventually remaining banned. Two cards were unlimited, Sinister Serpent and Megamorph. Sinister Serpent is a plus one every turn, with relatively little cost, although there are diminishing returns with multiple serpents in the graveyard. Megamorph seems a little tame compared to United We Stand and Mage Power, caring about the player's life total instead of cards on board, and out of the three is the only one with a drawback when you are ahead of your opponent. The ceiling of Megamorph can be higher though, and was even used as an option in the Cyberstein OTK, although that emergency ban list warrants its own video. While the January list was relatively new, there is a substantial overlap with the May list and those from the TCG video. It is a huge list, so I'm going to go over the repeats in less detail. Morphing Jar is a hand refill and potential plus 5 in card advantage. Slow, but incredibly powerful. Witch of the Black Forest is probably the best tutor in the game, fetching a wide toolbox of different cards depending on your current needs. Card Destruction operates on the same axis as Morphing Jar and is faster, although it does come at a minus one in card advantage. Delinquent Duo is the most efficient hand disruption card, as it is a two for one. Heavy Storm is mass spell and trap removal, though not quite at the level of Harpy's Feather Duster. Premature Burial is like Monster Reborn, but as it could be returned to the hand without destroying the monster, could lead to loops. Swords of Revealing Light moved from semi-limited to limited, perhaps in line with the limitation of Heavy Storm. Less spell and trap removal increases the stall potential of Swords of Revealing Light. So, the two were limited in tandem, perfectly balanced, as all things should be. Finally, Upstart Goblin went from 3 to 1, as it offers cycling one card, and the life point boost in your opponent's favor is of no concern in an Exodia deck, for instance. Now for the new additions, and there are also a lot of them. Exiled Force is deceptively good, as a one-for-one -one monster removal is rather rare in Yu-Gi-Oh, as many spells have a discard cost like Tribute to the Doomed, or were difficult to use effectively like Fisser. Taking up your normal summon, Exiled Force is a good trade when you can destroy an opponent's fusion or tribute summoned monster. Injection Fairy Lily is similar as it deals with one threat, but instead of card advantage, it costs your life points.
It is important to note that the attack gain could also swing life points into your favor. But my favorite use for the card was taking down Apocleafor Towers. Makura the Destructor is one of the strongest cards in the game, as a fundamental tenet of Yu-Gi-Oh is that traps have to be set before activation. In fact, Makura the Destructor can cause an FTK with a later entry on this list. Slate Warrior is remarkably strong, as most beater monsters in the game had 18 to 1900 attack points. But if you are already ahead, setting Slate Warrior could increase it to a 2400 attack monster with a very respectable 1900 base. Additionally, Slate Warrior had a permanent attack and defense reduction effect when it was destroyed as the result of battle, a condition which was much, much more common at the time. Slate Warrior was simply significantly better than most other generic cards. Twin-Headed Behemoth's limitation is one that requires a little bit of explanation, though. At the time, Twin-Headed Behemoth was worded incorrectly, such that you could reborn each behemoth once, and confusion occurred if the card was shuffled into the deck. To prevent this problem, Twin-Headed Behemoth was limited, and eventually given an erratum to become once per duel. Exchange of Spirit is also a card which got an erratum to be released from the ban list, albeit much later than Twin-Headed Behemoth. At the time, and in conjunction with Makura the Destructor, you could mill 15 cards from your deck, activate Exchange of Spirit, and swap your opponent's deck with their empty graveyard. This would deck out your opponent, and when they are unable to draw a card, they lose. Exchange of Spirit was a notorious OTK and FTK enabler, and the card was eventually reworked entirely. Reckless Greed is not Pot of Greed, at least without Makura the Destructor's effect. Reckless Greed is a minus one, as you expend the card and take away two turns of potential draws for the instant two cards. Although there is an argument for the short turn gains making the card valuable, the reason it was limited comes from an unintuitive interaction. When you activate multiple Reckless Greeds, you still only skip the next two draw phases, assuming they are activated in the same turn, of course. As a result, you could circumvent the downside of the card if you could activate more than one copy in a turn. Only a few cards were limited, with the first being Guardian Sphinx. Guardian Sphinx is one of those interesting desert monsters which could flip itself face down and had a flip-like effect when flipped face up. Face up, face down, play your strongest card. With high defense and mass bounce, the card could continuously deny your opponent tempo gains. The card did still require a tribute and was weak to the prominent card Nobleman of Crossout. Marauding Captain is a prominent actor in the lore of the cards, but in the context of the metagame, Marauding Captain offers a minor tempo swing as it brings a friend onto the battlefield. It is also worth mentioning that with multiple Marauding Captains on the field, your opponent was unable to declare an attack. Finally, another tutor was added to the list, one which could find Marauding Captain, a fact even displayed on the card's artwork. Huh. Reinforcement of the Army is a one-for-one -one tutor, similar to Last Will, but with a different set of restrictions, and much easier activation requirement. The power of the card only increases as more cards are printed. The 2002 OCG list was quite a shift, with so many cards moving around the list, but the combination of Makura the Destructor, Exchange of Spirit, and Reckless Greed all being limited was necessary to limit the impact of the FTK strategy. Next time, we get a lot of the goat staples. Ciao!